Welcome back. Let's talk a little bit more about taxonomy and classification and how we organize the living world. In particular, I want to I'll give you some of the characteristics of some of the life forms, some of the groups of life forms that we'll be referring to and talking about this semester. Now, remember that we said that our taxonomic scheme was based upon these boxes or these categories of living things. The categories in our hierarchy, remember that hierarchy, domain, right, phylum, kingdom, and so forth, down to genus and species. Each one of those is a particular taxon, a particular group. And in our hierarchical scheme, each one is composed of the taxa below it, or the other way to think of it is, each level of that taxonomic scheme has subgroups within it. Now, at the highest level of this taxonomic scheme, the highest taxon that we make use of is what's referred to as the domain level. And what we do right now, and the reason I say right now is because just a few years ago when I was teaching this course, we thought about the living world in a slightly different way. We didn't have the same organization of living things at that time, but now we think of there as being three key domains that all living things can be placed in. One of the things you could think of it is that this is three large boxes. And any life form that we find, we can place into one of these three boxes based upon its characteristic uh, features, based upon its makeup, based upon its cellular structure, its metabolic or chemical characteristics. So what are those three categories? We have the archaea, the bacteria, and then the domain eukarya. Let's take a look at some of those. Now, these domains, as you know already, can be subdivided into kingdoms, which are then divided into phyla and classes and orders, the whole way down to the species level. And that's true for whichever of those three domains we're talking about. Some of these classification schemes are easier than others. Some, very difficult to try to determine exactly where an organism should be placed. Now, the members of the domain archaea and bacteria. So the members of both of these domains are types of organisms that are called prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are organisms that do not have their DNA inside of a membrane container. So inside their cells, their DNA is not encased with a membrane. They lack a nucleus. As a matter of fact, the name prokaryon, prokaryote, comes from some Greek root words that means before the nut or before the nucleus. Okay? Now, some examples of these are very small organisms. When you take a microbiology class, you'll have an opportunity to see some of them. These bacteria and also these archaea, you can see that they have some similar characteristics. They're single-celled organisms. They're quite small. They're all microscopic, basically but there are certain key features that cause us to see them as being different groups, especially when you look at them in terms of the chemical makeup, the molecular makeup of their cells. Bacteria are unicellular. They're prokaryotic. Remember, that means without a nucleus. They come in a wide variety of forms, and three of the more common forms are the bacilli. Uh, that's sort of a, a sausage shape. Sometimes you'll hear people call those rods. Cocci. Those are circular cells. And spirilli, those are cells that have sort of a corkscrew shape to them. They have a very interesting kind of carbohydrate protein material making up their cell walls called peptidoglycan. And they're the only organisms that have this peptidoglycan material. It's a key feature of those. And they also possess structures called flagella that have a very specific way of moving, which gives some of these bacteria the ability to move Therefore, they have motility. Not all bacteria, but many do. Let's consider some of the characteristics of the archaea, also unicellular, also prokaryotic. But now notice that their cell wall has a very different kind of chemical. I shouldn't say very different. It's similar to the peptidoglycan in bacteria, but now we call it pseudopeptidoglycan. Matter of fact, just a few years ago, the archaea were grouped together with the bacteria. They were considered to be members of the same domain. Nowadays, though, we have realized that these archaea have a number of characteristics that cause us to see them as being distinct from the bacteria. One of those characteristics, one of those molecular differences, is the pseudopeptidoglycan molecule that makes up their cell walls. Now, it's similar in structural features to peptidoglycan. It's also carbohydrate and protein, but it's distinct enough, it's different enough, 
that we realize that these archaea really shouldn't be grouped together with the bacteria and that there are some significant differences. Now, the other reason that these archaea are interesting, and I'll mention them a couple other times this semester just because they are so fascinating, is that these are organisms that you might see called extremophiles. Some of them, for example, are extreme thermophiles. These organisms can live in the very hottest environments on this planet. As a matter of fact, when Mount St. Helens blew up and people went to check just a few days, weeks later, at the hot, very steamy, boiling water that was left behind in the crater of Mount St. Helens, guess what they found living there? Archaea. When we go to someplace like Yellowstone and we find those very hot springs there, or we go to the bottom of the ocean, and you may have seen on TV those uh, hot smokers, black smokers, superheated water coming out of the bottom of the ocean floor, we look there and guess what we find? That that environment has lots of members. Archaea again. Now it's not to say that there aren't also some bacteria that can live in these extreme environments, but these archaea are the champs. They live in one of the, in, in the most extreme environments anywhere on the planet. The coldest, the hottest, the saltiest, the driest environments, that's where we find the archaea. So a very interesting group. I'll mention them a few times. It's not going to be a focus this semester, but I just find them to be so interesting that I have to mention them at least a couple more times. Now, if we look at that third domain I mentioned, the domain Eukarya, what we're going to find is that here's where we have the four kingdoms that most of us are most familiar with. So we're going to talk about the Eukarya as being composed of four kingdoms of organisms. Remember, the Eukarya are organisms that do have a nucleus. We have the Protista, the Fungi, the Plantae, and the Animalia. And let's take a look at some of the basic characteristics of some of these organisms. The protozoa, a type of protista. You might be more familiar with that word protozoa. It sort of means uh, an animal-like unicellular organism. So they're unicellular. They are eukaryotic. And some people would consider them to be somewhat animal-like. It's really not the most appropriate way to think of them. But we find them in a variety of environments you may be familiar with or you may have heard of organisms like an amoeba or a paramecium. These are organisms that would be in this grouping. Single-celled, they live all over the place. They're found in water environments, uh, soil environments. Some of them are even parasitic on organisms like ourselves. They have the ability to both absorb food right from the environment through their cell surface and in some cases they actually have oral grooves or oral structures that allow them to take food in from the environment. They're ingestive feeders. But you could think of them as being, oh, a simplistic way to think of them is single-celled animals. Eh, not the best way, but it works okay. Another group of protista are what people commonly call the algae or algae. Now these are also organisms that are eukaryotic. They're a little more plant-like, however, because in particular they have the ability to carry out photosynthesis. Most of them are unicellular, but there are some very large multicellular forms. So now notice, here we have this group called the protista that are mostly small organisms, but in some cases, as you might think of things like some of the large seaweeds that you see off the west coast of the United States, we have very large organisms, but because of their makeup, because of their cellular structure, because of features of their reproduction, they're still classified as members of the protista. Now, another group, the fungi, are ones that I'm sure you've run into quite a number of times. They're either unicellular or multicellular. Let's think of a unicellular example, something like yeast. Think about the yeast you might have used to get your bread, bread to rise recently, or the yeast used in brewing processes. Those are examples of the fungi. But there's also multicellular fungi, something like a mushroom would be an example of a multicellular fungus. Now these are also eukaryotic, and one of the distinctive features of these organisms is that their cell wall, because their cells have walls, similar to the cell walls of plants, but their cell walls have a carbohydrate protein mixture that's called chitin. Now chitin's found in other organisms, but the fungi are the only organisms that use chitin as part of their cell wall structure. Now, 
they are said to be a saprophytic heterotroph. What's this mean? Well, saprophytic means that they live on death, which if you think about it, think about where you've seen mushrooms or where you've seen molds. They're commonly growing on, oh, dead things, uh, decaying trees in the forest. Uh, they are saprophytic, living on death. Heterotroph means that they're an organism that can't make their own food. In the previous slide, notice that I said that the algae were photosynthetic autotrophs, which means that they can make their own food if they're just provided with some sunlight energy. Well, the fungi, like us, are heterotrophic. They're organisms that can't make their own food and rely on other living things for their food resource. And for many fungi, those other living things are going to be dead living things. The plantae, here's another example of photosynthetic autotrophs, organisms that can use sunlight to power the production of their own food. We'll cover this process in a chapter later. They're multicellular. They're also eukaryotic. Their cell wall was made up of a carbohydrate, primary carbohydrate made in their, it, that's present in their cell walls called cellulose. And notice what they have the capacity to do. One of the key features that we think of as the functions of plants is their production of oxygen. So you might see them classified as an oxygenic, photosynthetic autotroph. All right, we'll, we'll talk about those different attributes of these qualities of this group as we move further on in the semester. Finally, the animalia, eukaryotic organisms, multicellular, absorptive and ingestive feeders, heterotrophs, rely on other living things. Well, that's the group we belong in. I think if you think about those other groups that we've just listed, I'm clearly an animal, much more so than I am a plant or a fungus. And I have characteristics that allow me to be grouped together with other organisms in this taxon called the animalia. Remember. Where are we? We're in the domain Eukarya, the kingdom Animalia. There's some illustrations showing you some examples of these organisms that are found in these groups. Of course, this isn't the full range of variety of organisms, but as you can see, we have some organisms that are the single-celled protozoan protista. There aren't any examples, oh, I'm sorry, yes, there are, of the single-celled algae protista. We have members of the plantae, members of the fungi, and then, of course, the sloth would be our example of the kingdom animalia. Well, let's summarize what we've looked at this time under taxonomy. Once again, we were considering how life was organized. And we were thinking about it in terms of the individual types of organisms that we want to try to be able to name. We want to use a taxonomic scheme to classify organisms. And here in the taxonomy, we were emphasizing those taxons at the domain level, where we were describing the characteristics of the particular taxa that we call the domains. What were they again? Remember those three domains, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya two prokaryotic domains, one eukaryotic domain. And we'll talk much more about all of those in future lectures. Thanks very much. Look forward to seeing you next time.